welcome back to, to our podcast at Access to Perspectives Conversations. And welcome Zoe Mullen to another episode where we will be talking about translations. It's a great pleasure having you here. Thanks very much, Joe. It's great to be here. Cool. So Zoe works for The Lancet, who recently um, announced that they established translations or that they invite translations of research summaries for that matter um, and um, are in the process or have established a process to standardize um, translation work to make research articles more accessible to bilingual and multi multilingual um, research audiences and readers. So um, maybe getting into the topic, would you mind talking a little bit about how this decision by the Lancet editorial team came about and yeah, and how how it's being adopted by the by the researchers and authors? Sure. Yeah, so um it all started, I think, with my um, with my colleague Anne Roker, who's who's no longer with us, but she was um, a senior editor um, uh, back in 2018. I think uh, we started this, um, and she is a, a French speaker. Uh, her native language is French, and um, uh, so she has a, a strong interest in in um, multilingualism. And she made the point very strongly. Um, that as an open access journal, uh, the Lancet Global Health was, you know, opening up um, accessibility to authors, researchers, and and indeed the general public um, on a financial level. So we have no barriers to reading in terms of being um, able to uh, to see the work that we publish. There are no subscription barriers, for example. But that wasn't the only barrier. It wasn't the mm. only access barrier. Um, you know, there, there is a vast uh, number of people in the world who do not speak English at all or do not speak English as a first language. And so, in effect, um, you know, we were still failing to reach um, a, a great number of potential um, readers just through publishing solely in English. Um, so that was where it came from. Um, it was the idea that we wanted to be open, we wanted to be accessible, but um, we hadn't managed to break down all the barriers to accessibility, um, just the financial ones. So she was the person who really kind of got this onto our radar. And once we started to talk about it internally, it was, it was, you know, it was seen as um, a no brainer in a way, really, of course, of course, you know, just publishing in English is a barrier to access. Um, so we so we kind of took it from there. OK, so um, basically having a team colleague in house who knows of the challenges and is very much aware because of her, or in this case, her. Um, yeah, French, French speaking or francophone background. And and then was it difficult to to convince the team and also the management to to take the next steps? Because I assume there's a lot of organizational extra work that's coming your way, and that, with that also costs and um, so not what well, an easy decision to take the or to acknowledge that it makes sense. But then on the operational level, it's a whole extra effort, basically on top of the already ongoing tasks and deliverables yes that's right that, absolutely those were the um the main internal barriers i would say are the um uh the, the kind of logistical ones the with the work related ones um we'd kind of toyed with this idea a little bit in the past how could we how could we start to translate more content um more regularly but it is an expensive process to to take on um uh linguists who know the subject matter um mm. and you know uh, uh, um which languages do you choose uh you know and so and and uh, and how do you work that um additional step into a streamlined workflow that doesn't hold up the publication process too long mm. um so we'd always found that just too you know there were too many ifs and buts and um difficulties to to get it going but this time uh we came up we, we aimed to come up with a a workflow that was um uh 
basically disrupted the existing work workflows as little as possible and at um, virtually no cost. We, we, we actually had no budget um, to uh, to put this into place. So our, our aim was to find something um, extremely cheap and um, non-disruptive. Um, and the best way we decided we could do that was by um, actually having it as an option that the authors took on themselves. So we decided to um, offer authors the opportunity once their manuscript had been accepted uh, to translate themselves the abstract into whichever language they felt most appropriate to mm -hmm. the audience. And that could be more than one language and they could be very unusual languages. So we've, um, we've had translations into to Zulu and um, and Indonesian um, and um, uh, uh, sort of uh, as well as the sort of French and Spanish and Portuguese main languages, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and we post them um, as additional uh, files alongside the the main manuscript, um, so they're not incorporated into the the body of the of the manuscript once it's published. They are supplementary files. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some limitations. It's not uh, it's not an ideal um, situation. Uh, we are exploring how we can make them more visible at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's the main ongoing challenge. Um, but there's certainly been a quite quite a good uptake. Um, I would say about 25% of, uh, of accepted manuscripts get translated into one language or another or several. Um, wow. So we see that as a pretty good, pretty yeah. good, um, you know, um, vote of confidence in, in the project. It's like a quarter of the submissions. It's pretty good. Um, and do you assign as supplementaries? Do the translations also get assigned their own DOIs? No, they're part of the same the, the same manuscript, so they're, mm. they're they're under the same DOI. So the main problem with that is that they're not uh, they're not searchable. So if you yeah. wanted to um, to do a search for the for the for the manuscript in the language of your choice, you couldn't you couldn't find it in PubMed or or a, mm. or a Google search at the moment because it's it's um, as I say it's not embedded into the HTML of the manuscript. It's only a supplementary PDF. So that's the main issue with it. But um, I must say there has been some great feedback um, from uh, from readers and from from the authors. Mm -hmm. Just had. It's almost, um, you know, it's almost uh, a signal of um, a signal of intent as much as anything. I think that this is yeah. an important thing, and this is the first step towards um, towards making it something. Yeah, that's, uh, it's a very usable. pragmatic step. Also, like you say, and it was, it's low budget. It's affordable for a publisher or a journal or a, yeah. um, an other editorial team with a limited budget. It incentivizes the authors also who probably have an urge to make their research efforts available in various languages to provide some sort of infrastructure that makes that possible. And yeah, as you said, it's a it's suddenly a step in the right direction, opening up um to a vast majority or not a majority, but about like many researchers are not capable of, of reading or speaking English so well or at all for the matter. Um, and then, it, I mean, even though it's not machine searchable as such just yet, it's it's possible to send uh, along the translations with or to to point out that there is a translation available. But there is that in your team is that basically on the to do list? What I heard also what you said earlier, it's like one step, and we're learning from the community also um, as whatever the infrastructure allows for how to further improve right so it's like um it's it's work in progress so to say also amongst your team yes that's right so um i think the next the next step is to make them more visible um at the moment um it it's a little bit difficult to find um manuscripts that do have a translation it's not immediately obvious so at the moment we're thinking about how we can flag that up more uh, prominently for mm -hmm. for readers to see mm -hmm. if they once they come 
across the English version, you know, please note there is also a you know a French or Portuguese or um, Amharic version available. Um, so that's the next step. Um, and the the slightly larger step after that is to try and somehow make them searchable. Yeah. Um, but that's that is very uh, infrastructure dependent, really. Um, yeah, so, and, and somewhat, yeah, might not be able to happen until we, uh, you know, move the whole of Elsevier onto a, a different um, platform, for example, which, um, you know, is obviously a big, a big ask and something that isn't going to happen just for our small translation project. Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's something that uh, a lot of the team, because we have a very multilingual um, team across the Lancet, there's always going to be somebody driving this internally, I think. Um, yeah. And once now we've established it um, externally and we're starting to sort of promote it a bit more, that will, you know, hopefully hold us to account as well that to sort of keep going with it and make it more um, usable in the future. Yeah, that's great. And to so ask, like, what do you count as a translation? Is it only if really the whole article is being translated or would you? Because I'm asking because um, I find this is like a like a huge extra effort to ask us of the researchers and normally would require a whole league of experts, translators, science journalists, um, re researchers who are knowledgeable of the other language, who are probably the practicing researchers who have been working on the project, but not necessarily only. And then like, because we're like with Africa Archive, a project that I'm also coordinating, we're currently doing such a project where we and like had um, thought we would translate the research articles and then came to learn that it's actually more feasible to create a lay summary and translate that into um, traditional African languages just for the fact that in some only spoken language, or they're actually written languages, the ones that are chosen, but many traditional languages do not have a, such vast technical terminology. So we actually have to also coin and define um, certain words and terminologies or terms um, and it's also depending on what we want to achieve with making the research available in various languages it's also maybe even more approachable and accessible to have it in a summary style instead the uh, research like an Imrat structure research article style so what like do you see different kinds of translational styles being submitted or course submitted as supplements so this is strictly um, research abstracts only. So okay. Um, okay. that's good. Yeah. yeah. So that uh, that again that makes it more more doable because we have to we have to build it into the workflow such that um, because all our our research manuscripts are tr um, quite heavily edited post acceptance mm. uh, by our in house team, um, we want the translated version to reflect the edited English version so it means the translation has to come quite late down the the workflow after mm -hmm. after English editing so there's not really time I don't think for to, to ask an author mm -hmm. to um to translate the whole article after it's been through the internal editing process yeah. so we just ask them to do the summary and I think the the reasons you gave there for for just doing the summary are actually quite um relevant to us as well because um you know it, it may be um the people who have less technical knowledge in the first place who want to be reading the translation and mm -hmm. you're right that actually um because english is the sort of lingua franca of science and has been for a long time there are there are pieces of terminology that just don't exist in in languages other than english so um so it, it, I think it, it it makes sense for us just to do the the abstracts for the time being, at least on this on this kind of regular workflow um, project. Mm -hmm. Having said that, we do actually offer, or we um, you know we accommodate um, translations of entire um, manuscripts or reports if the authors want to do it. So, for example, we published um, a commission on um, financing primary health care uh, recently uh, which is a sort of 25,000 word document um, and it's uh, it was published on our, our our website 
And after the fact, the author said, well, we have a little bit of budget left to to, you know, pay a translator to translate the whole thing into French. Um, so in that instance, we just enabled the authors to um, to to have the translated version, um, you know, styled into our our um, word processing kind of style um, and and to upload it onto the, the website, the platform with the English version. Mm -hmm. So. Um, although that isn't something we offer as a sort of regular workflow, um, I think if, you know, we, we want to be as open as possible to any author who has the means and the inclination to translate um, more than just the abstract. Yeah, I, I was also um, in a group or in a working group that was um, led by Crossref, um, where we discussed mostly preprints and then also as part of preprints, like translational works or translations and summaries um, or summaries as translations, no, translated summaries. Um, and that, there we agreed. And so there were a few, um, yeah, the, a few preprint um, community or preprint service and platform leaders and coordinators were present. And we all agreed that um, translations and also summaries of translations, as we do with decolonial science, and I presume also what you do with at the Lancet, is um, are should be able to get their DOI, their own DOIs, just like you said, to make them searchable and discoverable. Um, and I was personally hesitant before, but the translational work also comes with some sort of interpretation because in a different language, you always bring the experience and the cultural heritage of the language um, group with into the research project in to some degree, more or less, like certainly more in cultural studies and sociology and maybe less so in bioscience and modern science now with gene technology and those things. Um, and therefore there is basically also a level of interpretation and that basically then comes almost like a review sort of thing which probably deserves its own DI and it's all and to make it count as its own uh, research output in a way because there's also so much contextual knowledge from the language group going into the research and vice versa like learning from the research presented in English uh, making that accessible to the other language group kind of thing um but it, it's certainly not established and this is not to criticize again but rather to encourage further to yeah like also your team and other teams um maybe some other editors are listening to encourage to step establish workflows where that is possible that your eyes can be assigned, but also connected obviously to the original article that is being either translated in full or as a summary thereof. Um, yeah. yeah, can I just make a quick point on that? I think um, I think that that's 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 really interesting actually that that the point you make um, and I think it, it probably is um, much more relevant for kind of the social science type of work. I think at the Lancet we would we would want to see the translation as uh, a faithful um, duplicate, if you like, in a different language of mm. the of the English version. And that's why we, you know, we 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 only get the item translated after it's already been edited um, in house. So it's a so it's almost a a carbon copy, but in a different language. Um, if you like. So I think in that case, having a separate DOI, I think would be slightly misleading for us because it would suggest that it was a different, a different version. Whereas in fact, we want it to, we want it to, to, to be the same version, just accessible yeah. in a different language. So, um, so I think, yeah, it, 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 it might depend on the, on the subject area. And I think for biomedicine, like you say, it might not be quite as, um, as relevant um yeah. but um but i do yeah um it, it's a, it's a really interesting area because i think you know book translation for example if someone's translated a piece of fiction mm -hmm. you know that's a that's almost like a new you know a new book in itself because you mm -hmm. there's so much input from the translator in into the to the writing of a novel which which is as beautiful prose wise 
mm. uh, in, in a different language as it, as it was from the original um that's almost almost like a new um a new work in itself but I think for for certainly for biomedicine we'd want it to be a faithful copy rather than a different uh, yeah one. it's a very good point and the discussion is certainly not um done and over with um yeah but even for that I think yeah I, also not to be misunderstood like it's I think the level of interpretation is min like minimal like less than one percent or less than 0.1 percent really um where cultural heritage comes in through the language but like look if you look at it from a different perspective if a non-english speaking author or english as a second language author um writes about their research which they have conducted in their own mother tongue a lot of the like contextual knowledge might get lost and again also here certainly more in cultural studies and sociology or social sciences but then it's, it's just like I just generally want to make the statement that culture or language um, carries cultural context and with that also some sort of traditional knowledge and contextual knowledge which might get lost to a certain degree if you strip it up and trans if you translate to another language, we're not very firm with as a submitting author. And also when, even for English speakers, and if you publish in English and you think, oh, it has to be technical English, but some aspects of every research project, I would guess have still some, some cultural dimension, which might get lost um, if, if the research output is presented in a purely technical manner. But that's becoming a little bit philosophical. I don't know if that's too, too <laughs> I think it's a, as a concept. But. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is a, it's a tricky one, isn't it? But I think it's definitely worth some, you know, discussing um, a, a greater length at some point. Um, but it's probably, <laughs> probably not within the scope of our little project just at the minute. Mm. Um, what is your personal um, take on the translational work? Was there like an eye opener in the process where you realized, oh yeah, that actually makes sense. And I mean, it's obvious. I mean, we can all agree it makes sense to open scholarly publishing up to multilingualism of some degree. But do you also have a personal story that comes along where you felt, okay, we as a team, we were now able to facilitate um, one particular project to reach wider where you were personally involved with, which you know made the extra effort worthwhile. I you know I was surprised I think even myself um, at at the range of languages that were that were taken up mm -hmm. um, when when we launched this. Um, I were yeah I, and and I think slightly humbled by um, by just how keen authors were to to translate into some you know some what what are to me quite unusual languages but are so important because they are done in the um you know in a community that that speaks that language principally and not not english and not even um you know perhaps the the, the official language of the country um which might be something other than english but you know is yet another more regional uh, or tribal language you know that um that is um not rare but it, you wouldn't you know you wouldn't think to see it in in the pages of a mm -hmm. of a, a you know a, a global journal and you know something where the script is is very unusual um yet um i think it's you know we are in our work to, in global health trying to um you know do a lot of decolonizing um work uh where we um we make some effort to make sure that uh, research projects that we publish uh, are as um, have been done in an uh, equitable way. So, if we see some research that's been submitted um, and it's been done in a you know in a community in a in a low income country in Africa, for example, um, and we know that there's been a lot of um, input from from the you know um from researchers on the ground from um, health workers on the ground from um you know people collecting data on the ground and yet the authorship on the the manuscript is sort of 100 percent north america and europe 
you know, we're, we're now starting to say, no, that that research isn't going to be published with us because. I, yeah, I saw that announcement was so well taken up, like in my community, which are all very much concerned with exactly that issue that you highlight. Um, like, can you just say a few more words also why, what brought your team to make that announcement? Because that's really a game changer to, and it also perfectly lines with it. Let me just briefly add that, um, like with our work with Africa Archive, we tried from the beginning to have the same mm -hmm. approach. Primarily, we like Africa Archive has an open access portal and preprint pre repository with an with a focus on F research coming out of Africa by African scholars primarily, and also non-African scholars who study African topics. And for the latter, we want to encourage increasingly so I want to sensitize that exactly what you just said wouldn't happen as much anymore in the future at, or at all if there's any research being done by non-African scholars they would be requested to seek collaborative research projects with African scholar scholars as partners as project partners and then co-submit or submit as co-authors and co-contributors so what what it yeah and it's we, we still see a lot of research well, not yeah out there also what we kind of trace and can see on um, cultural studies and African studies on Africa without any involvement of African scholars. Um, so what how what was the behind the scenes discussion that led to that announcement at the Lancet? Yeah, I think it was a long a long time in in the coming, um, and I think it that you know there have been lots of very very powerfully written um, pieces. We we published a collection um, earlier this year called "What's Wrong with Global Health," mm -hmm. and um, we invited um, scholars from um, low and middle income countries principally to 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 well to write to us about about what they saw were the issues with. Um, uh, with researching global health uh, specifically. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, um, you know, actually allowing the people who um, kind of live global health to speak out and say what the issues were from their perspective, I think was very illuminating for us and um, and, and led us more firmly down down this path to the point where we, we made some of these statements. Um, so I think you know when when we're talking about global health, particularly and um, making uh, research um, aims and uh, um, objectives stated in in projects, you know that are, that are about the community, um, we need to keep that community in mind all the way through, um, and whether that's involving um, researchers, um, health workers, community members from that community in the not just the writing of the report but the design of it from from the start mm. um you know we don't we don't want to be having somebody in a high income country invent a research question back in their their you know ivory tower in london um and then sort of come in and say right we're doing this project and uh, oh would you like to put your name on it because then it will look slightly better you know so it's proper you know it's proper involvement of um of, of um individuals from the community in the research design as well as the the um the process and also the writing and then through to the you know to the dis um dissemination of it i think that's where the language fits in you know if you are seriously um uh concerned principally about the community that you're working in and not just your own kind of um uh, CV or you know publication um, profile, then um, you know you should be making efforts to tran to translate it um, literally um, to the community and and to disseminate it and um, yeah. and truly try and make a difference there. Absolutely, yeah. That's also an often complaint I hear directly and indirectly that when research in in communities is being like knowledge is being extracted but never brought back to the community like and sometimes even the researchers often want to come back but then there's no time and no budget to do so and to um but if it's properly planned for as you said before the project even starts and to think about the potential stakeholders who should also participate in the project design 
um, to sort of reasonable and feasible extents. Um, because we like it's they usually come without any payment, or some of the stakeholders in the region don't get paid for the extra work and the interviews and the collection, or that but they should be compensated one way or the other. And actually, in many cases, there should actually be a budget also to pay these people. Um, but as a as an editorial team, is like you. You can do so much, and that's what you did, right? To raise awareness to that um, necessity and best practice. But when submissions are coming in, the work is already done. Like the project is done, and now it's being presented and submitted to to you. Um, or do you see that you have an influence to maybe for the future projects of these authors to sensitize for 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 other projects? Yeah, I mean, we have rejected manuscripts simply because the authorship was um, was not reflective of the um, of the work that was evidently done. Um, and uh, and on, on a couple of occasions, well, hopefully that's led to yeah to future projects being um, um, better uh, better thought through in terms of um, equity. But in a in a couple of instances. Um, it has actually led to a resubmission to us um, mm. with um, with input from from some of the um, people who should have been on the authorship to begin with. So it doesn't, you know, it it doesn't get away from the fact that perhaps the uh, the research question wasn't entirely. Um, put together with with the community involvement, but certainly the writing of it. Um, to us, to a certain extent, that can be that can be um, adjusted after the after the project has been done. How it's like for 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 um, instance, this goes back to cultural interpretation. So, you know, you may have the same findings from your from your um, research. You've got the same numbers in table three, but when you're writing your discussion, your interpretation, that may be very different. If you've got somebody who's actually working and living in that community looking at those data and thinking, well, what does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. um, and it might be something quite different from what the, um, you know, from what the Northern partners had actually interpreted it as meaning. So uh, on a couple of occasions, we have actually had resubmissions in which the authorship has changed. The, um, the conclusions have been rewritten with the input of those um, on the ground. Nice. And, um, and and so yeah, I think I think that's that's potentially a good outcome, and hopefully yeah, will will lead to more um, thoughtful um, project planning from the beginning in the next time round. Mm. And just to close the circle, it's back to our original topic because this is obviously also a topic that's very important to both of us and also um, us as access to perspectives. I had a previous episode um, on helicopter research, is basically what um, like the term for what what we described earlier um and how like and he is a kenyan scholar um and he said even as kenyans like even us we we do the same mistakes nowadays like working with in his case fishermen and um like it's it's an extra effort an, an extra thought process and um to but his team also makes a lot of effort to educate but also learn from the fishermen about fisheries and fishery or for his fisheries research and to unlearn making assumptions from uh from the ivory tower perspective about how fisheries should be or not be and how it can be improved or not because the fishermen have the actual experience on the ground and how they can breed the fish best what the obstacles are what to be aware of weather conditions what not water quality um, where the researchers can then come in with their science and knowledge about the ecosystem um, and in collaboration, yeah, then bring about, like, uh, you know, actually ha have both stakeholders and also other stakeholders learn from the exercise of, of working together in a project. Would you, so also looking towards the translational aspect, like a, a question to come back to our original topic of translations would be, have some of these um, decolonized um, articles also had 
translations into our respective local languages um, just by coincidence. Or, and then I was also gonna come to another question like with the credit taxonomy, how does your, or does your team um, also look at the credit taxonomy as, and where do you draw the line and who would still be considered as a co-contributor or AKA co-author? Um, can that also be non-scholars or like, especially when it comes to global health, you said there is like medical personnel who might contribute to the research project. Would these also be accepted or be like encouraged to be co-contributors along the, the credit taxonomy ideology? That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so a few questions there. I think um, I'm not going to be able to point to a specific article that was um, where the authorship was sort of changed and then we translated it, but I'm sure it's yeah, it, no, it must okay. have happened. Um, but um, in terms of the the second part of your question, um, the Lancet doesn't um, it doesn't actually use the credit tech, um, taxonomy as such. Um, I think there was a a concern that having a sort of um, something like that makes it a little bit too easy for authors to uh, to sort of assign um, authorship on a almost like a checkbox mm -hmm. basis. Oh, I think we could probably shoehorn so and so into that you know that um, that particular okay. um, line in the taxonomy. So we we feel that a much uh, a more um, a uh, free text description of a contr contribution is is a slightly better way to do it. So we actually prompt authors to write in their own words what each author contributed to the paper. Mm -hmm. um, and we find that that tends to give a more um, realistic description of what those those contributions actually were. Mm -hmm. And um, and of course, we refer authors to the ICMJ um, authorship criteria, um, and uh, so they should they should be having those in mind when they're assigning authorship. But we don't uh, we we tend not to get involved with saying who can and can't be an author, and that certainly means that um, you know you don't have to have an MD or a PhD to be an author on a Lancet journal. So I think anyone who has made a substantial contribution to the design, um, the analysis, the writing, um, whoever they may be, um, should should qualify to be an author. Um, and if you can describe honestly what that person has con contributed um, um, and, uh, and yeah, they, they, in your mind count as an author then that's that's what we that's what we go with we don't and we're not particularly um uh prescriptive on on who should be an author and who shouldn't that's very much up to the the team themselves but we do ask for you know a, a definition of what they've done okay well then yeah makes a lot of sense and i personally also see the credit, credit taxonomy more like a guideline and also, data collection is essential to the success of a research project, and that can be done by an undergraduate student or an assistant. And then the question is, do these people need the, the acknowledgement through co-authorship, or is there another form? And is this also career boosting for them? So does that provide some sort of um, compensation for the effort? And otherwise, do they get paid for the work? And even if they get paid, is it, would, can they make use of, of that acknowledgement in that form, or is there another more feasible um, yeah, compensation mechanism? Um, but still, I think it's, it's also a matter of research integrity to list the people who contribute to the success of to the results of a research project um, one way or the other. And acknowledgements, the acknowledgement section, like I've always found this a funny part like, okay, we thank these people for contributing to our work and why they're not co-authors. And like, where, like it's also very random where people draw the line here. And I think it's also a cultural thing, or like a discipline cultural thing of having acknowledgements or not. And what's enough contribution to make you a co-contributor. But you know, I think it's a never, 
it's a very, I don't know, a long story to discuss in depth. <laughs> Could be, yeah. I think, um, you know, any, uh, someone who's just collected data, I think, um, you know, probably probably doesn't constitute full authorship. Um, but but I think, you know, any anyone who has collected data should be given the opportunity to get involved in the rest of it um, if they should have the time um, and, and the compensation um, potentially. Yeah. Um, uh, and if they don't, then then I think they should they should be acknowledged um, because, of course, um, authorship has, you know, great responsibilities as well. So if you're signing as an author, you have mm -hmm. to remember that this person also um, takes responsibility for the integrity of the whole manuscript. Right, yeah. So if this person has just done a little bit of data collection, uh, they might not actually want that huge responsibility. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, they should be given the option, as I say, I think, to to get involved at any level and um, and mm -hmm. um, whatever they choose um, as their level of involvement should be, um, uh, you know, um, acknowledged in in the appropriate way be that authorship or or acknowledgement um mm. yeah yeah no that yeah from that perspective it makes a lot of sense again and it is yeah I, I also felt like when at some point when i was invited for co-authorship as a as a in my case then an undergraduate student i felt both honored but also overwhelmed like what but i only did so little and how's that even like uh intellectual contribution to the paper but yeah but I think it's also part of the process on in the academic um, career trajectory and growing into becoming a, a scholarly author and contributor cool yeah. great thank you so much for sharing all these insights from from the Lancet global health um, team um, is there anything um like that you would still like to share with the audience, with the listeners, um, any concluding remarks or something that came to mind with you, which we haven't um, still talked to and you think belongs to this topic? I think we could probably talk for hours about this topic and it's uh, um, the things that radiate off from, from that topic. Um, but no, I think, I think that's, I've covered everything I, I wanted to talk about um, in this, um, in this podcast. Thank you. And I would just say, you know, if anyone is listening and wants to um, uh, contribute, give us feedback on our program, then, um, you know, I'd be really open to that um, because our, our, our project's still ongoing. We're still polishing it and um, it would be good to hear what people think of it. Yeah. Yeah, I've also learned a few new um, aspects of what to consider when it comes to translation. Yeah, so um, there's certainly more to explore and to learn um, from each other as we tap into the aspects of um, digitally facilitating translational works in scholarly results and presentation there. Um, yeah, and grow the multilingual scholarly community. Thank Absolutely. you so much again. And yeah. Welcome again um, on the, where we can deep dive on any other of the other topics that we've briefly touched upon. There's plenty more to talk about. Indeed. Thanks very much for having me.